Hello, this is Deo Moano with Persevere to Excel podcast. I am so excited for my interview today. I have my good friend Joey Witten with me. Joey. <laughs> What's up, Joey? What's happening? How you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. How are you? I know. I just called him Joey. And he, he's o- used to... The, maybe he's, he's seven used- people... <laughs> on earth that are allowed to call me that you being one so you know what's funny i feel like every time when i <clears throat> say your last name i always have to add the we yeah in front of joey <laughs> yeah even though i always say hey, what's up joe right, right, right. right no it's all good awesome awesome well joe thank you so much for joining me today in this amazing uh snowy day in new hampshire i know man how you feeling man how you feeling about the snow <clears throat> i hate it because i own a business where i have to shovel out every customer site. Oh, so when man. I when I when I see snow coming, a little fear creeps oh, in. Man, yeah. yeah. No, I do, I definitely feel that. <laughs> I think if it's obviously if it's business related, then you got you gotta get up. You yeah. gotta once that snow stops falling, you gotta go out there and clear up. Early morning shoveling. Yeah. What do you and, th- what do you think about the snow? Yeah, you know what? Like I have children and um but my blood is still from Africa. You know I'm from the Congo so <laughs> right. When I see that snow, I'm like, all right, I think it might be time to pack up and move to a warmer place. But yeah, yeah. But my kids love it though. They and you're, and you're, from what I understand, your snowblower recently broke. Oh man, yeah. So that that's a crazy story, man. And I you have, do you have a temper or no when that happens? You know, I try to channel in my temper. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. I try to, I, I let it manifest in different ways. Okay. And hopefully, it doesn't impact anybody else. But it was one of those things where. Previous years, I've had to deal with the whole, you know, getting a new starter because you left the gasoline in the old snowmobile, you know what I mean, the snowblower, and you got to switch it up. So then I learned the hard way to buy the expensive one, you know, the one that Home Depot in the little can, you know what I mean? So so then this year, I was excited. I was like, all right, I'm I'm doing due due diligence, and I have this, you know, everything is good. I cranked it up. It's working fine. Big snow comes in. Go out there. Start, you know, plowing and everything and clearing the snow. Um, the machine shuts down. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go get gas, you know, switch the gas, put the gas in, go in, crank it. I guess I've been working out a lot, even though I haven't all of a sudden the handle Snap. snapped off, Gone. you know what I mean? And then I'm yeah. 75% in. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna put the snow, snow blower back, you know, and then tomorrow morning Finish. I can work on it. Here's the problem that next morning we got more snow than the first day. Exactly. Yeah. You got like 12 inches, you walk outside. You can't even see your cars. You know what I mean? So I stepped out. So that when it was 75%, 15% of that, 25% of that, I just kind of manhandled it with my hands. So that next day, I went outside and I was like, oh, snap. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and it yeah. was one of those things where it's like, the wife and the kids are inside the house, like they're counting on you. To take the snow out. You know what right. I mean? Like, yeah. that is out there. Shoving. This is it. So that's I'm, why you're there that day. You're, that's the only reason is to make sure the snow's gone. Exactly. They don't need you for anything else. N- nothing. Nothing that's at all. You know what yeah. I mean? They're in there, you know, drinking hot chocolate, probably. Yeah, you know, doing their thing. You, if you look at the house, you can see them in the window looking at you. <laughs> yeah, they're waiting for the. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. then I come out. I'm like, bro, I don't have the tools. I don't yeah. have the right tools for this. Like, I brought my toolbox here. It's actually here in the shop. Okay. And uh, I'm sitting there. I'm like. All right, I'm gonna go to Home Depot. So I went mm. to Home Depot, yeah. went to the technician where the service place where you rent stuff. And I'm not even making this up. And I yeah. go up, look at the guy, waited mm-hmm. probably a good 10 minutes until he was done helping the dude in front of me. Sure. My turn, he's looking at me like sizing me up. I'm like, hi, sir. Um, <laughs> I think I said, sir. That's your first mistake. You know what right I mean? <laughs> yeah, you gotta he's say, gonna take advantage no, of No, no, you gotta say, sir. No. I'm gonna, <laughs> listen, this is what we're gonna do. My string broke. Right. I need you to fix it. So, so that's what I was thinking in my head, but that's not what came up. So right. I said, "Hello, sir." <laughs> hey, um, I was thinking. <laughs> no, 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 no. He said there's okay. a. There, he said there's a 14, 14 days uh, wait period if you got a snowblower. So then I was like, "No, no, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not planning on dropping it off. Got you. I just don't have the right tools. I'm trying to take this screw out. Yeah. And I was wondering if you guys help got tools out. to help me out. Yeah. Straight up, he looked at me and he said, I don't think we got those tools. 
So I was going to tell them, hey, at, it's at Home Depot. At Home Depot. Right. You know, at the at the rental service area. Where right? they repair. Right. Okay. Go ahead. So I'm following. <laughs> I am. So in my head, I'm like, okay, so I'm trying to tell them, can you just come out in the car with me? <laughs> So you can, right. so you, cause I don't know how to describe, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know how to describe yeah. like this, what type of screw it is, you know? So could you come to my, I have hot chocolate. No, could no, you no, come no, to no. my house. Yeah. Te- right, technically, you know, I'm, I parked in the car, you know, right close to them. So, yeah, yeah. so he goes and he says, um, you gotta go to, um, I think it was called like steel Smith or something, Huff steel or something. It's on Mammoth road. Yeah. You go there, they'll help you out. And at that point, I was like... I know exactly what you're talking about. I was like, hold up a second. Why is this happening to me right now? Like, I came to Home Depot. Like, you guys are supposed to be right. helping me solve this issue right yeah. now. And you're sending me somewhere else. Right. So now, listen. I get in my car, and I even had that shop on my, on my GPS. Yes. And then I'm like, all right, I'm going to stop by Sullivan Tires. <laughs> so, and ask if they have right, a Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I, so, so uh, instead of going to Sullivan Tires... I decided to go into um, AutoZone. Okay. Because I'm like, you know, that. Yeah. Why, wh- who is Sullivan Tires going to take their time to help me? Yeah. Go to AutoZone, you know. They got some tools. They got some people exactly. there. So yeah. I walk in, and the, the guy's like, I'm like, can you just please come to, come, to, come to the car with me real quick so you can see what it is? Yeah. He's like, well, I'm the only one in the store right now. There's another gentleman outside. I go out. This other gentleman is helping a lady who's uh, windshield, windshield wipers. Wiper. Yeah. So at that point, I'm like, right, I'm just going to go with Sullivan Tires. So I walk in Sullivan Tires. I'm like, guys, hi, how you doing? Um, I got this snowblower in the car. I'm having a hard time taking the screw out manually. Is there any way you can help me? The guy's like, it's in your trunk right now? I'm like, yeah, it's in my trunk. And the guy's like, all right, I'm, I'm going to come out. So he brings an Allen wrench and this other stuff, puts it in, and he, you know, start cranking a little bit. And it gets loose. And all he's like, Dale, you're good to go. So then I had to go back to Home Depot just to buy another Allen wrench because now I knew what I was looking for because yeah. I didn't even know what I needed. Yes. Bought the Allen wrench, came home, <laughs> cranked it up. Anyways, make a long story short, I uh, ended up solving the issue. Long story short, folks, Sullivan Tire, sponsor. Okay? 100%, 100%. If you don't sponsor, you got issues. Home Depot, you'll never, you're rejected. We're not, we don't want you. Ah, oh, it's such a wild thing. Anyways, but um, yeah, so you know that that was my uh, my twenty four hour ordeal, and I ended up making a little video on it because I actually made the video because I I was actually reflecting, like as I was making the video, I yeah. was reflecting on how I was feeling at that moment, right? Regarding this whole entire ordeal, so I didn't even get to work until eleven o'clock, right? You know what I mean? But it's just part of life, you know. Sometimes you just gotta. Yeah, you're, you, I think uh, you're a bigger man than most. I would have, there would have been swearing. My <laughs> snowblower would have been in the middle of the street. I would have called out of work. So you, I think you went above and beyond. Thank you, man. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate Congratulations. it. Congratulations. Well, I guess that was, that was our opening. Yeah. But anyways, I'm so <laughs> happy you're here today, yeah, man. Dude. And um, thank you for I, having I would, me. I would, I just, I just want to know, like, what, what you've been up to, what you've been doing. You know, part, part of this whole entire discussion for me, meeting with different folks, is about um, just understanding their journey, right? Mm. Understanding their journey and understanding, like, the moves that they've made that's yeah. gotten them to where they are today and also where they're going. So I would love to get a little bit of background of who you are and um, what you're messing with right now with, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, born and raised in New Hampshire, uh, father of a missionary, uh, and uh, my, my dad's a missionary, my mother's an entrepreneur bookkeeper, she's owned her bookkeeping business for 30 years, and was raised in a household, uh, grew up in the church, and was just raised in a household where, you know, um, community and serving was really important, with a dad that spent all of his time doing that, you know, and then also on the other end, being a hustler and, and owning a business and doing every you, everything you can to really set yourself apart financially was also important. So I kind of grew up in, in a weird home in a way because those two things don't really go together. Mm-hmm. You either serve, not much money that comes along with that, or you run a business and you do everything you can to kind of get yourself to the next level financially. So um, that's kind of the dynamic that I grew up in. And I don't know. I just I've always kind of been a hustler and always wanted to be an entrepreneur and and business owner and I love business. Um, you know, and people always you know people always say you oh, you better love what you do. You mm-hmm. know, 
for me, it's kind of weird. It's like as long as it's just having to do with business and growth and sales and and developing something from scratch, I just love it. It could be really anything. I think it's more about the the process of it, you know, and just being in business. So, um, you know, that that's kind of who I've always been. You know, um, no, that's awesome. I'm, yeah. I'm I'm a little curious to know. And w- when did you start identifying that that was your that was like your pathways? Like that was like the space that you wanted to be in. Yeah, um, that's a great question. I mean, I was telling you before about McDonald's. At 12, um, instead of playing during the summer or what have you, at 12 I applied for a job at McDonald's to work and make money, you know. Um, and uh, and I got hired, and that was my first job, and I went from job to job as a young kid. Um, and, you know, my parents, um, they did the whole Amway thing. Do you know what Amway is? No, I have no idea what Amway it's is. Like, so today, multi-level marketing is a big deal. Like, everyone does multi Right, marketing. right, like through social media and all different ways. Yeah, and... well, in the in the 80s and 90s, there was like two or three, and one of the biggest ones was Amway. It was like products shipped to your house and like different, you sign different people up and stuff. And so my parents were deep into that for a lot of years. And so I grew up in a household where it was like, you know, multi-level marketing. We got to sign this person up and sign that person up. Um, and I can remember being 14 and, and walking Elm Street and trying to sell toilet paper to the large buildings. Oh, wow. Like the Brady and Sullivan building before it was Brady and Sullivan and, right. and Antignos buildings. Just going in and asking to speak to the janitorial service and be like, hey, I, I got toilet paper from Amway. If That's incredible. Buy. So, you know, I think it was always in me. I, I don't know. I, um, the pursuit of success has always enticed me. Mm-hmm. Um, and that could be bad, you know, but, but it also could be good in some ways. So, um, I don't know what specifically, but just as a kid, I can remember just wanting to do well, um, just wanting to be successful and, and wanting to be known for doing something great. So, And even at that young age, did you have some early wins and success that made you feel like, oh, I can actually kind of do this? I'm curious to know. Yeah. So I told you before, too, like um, when I was a kid, so when I was 13 or 14, I got a job at Blockbuster. And I just told you the story. So I'm sorry. But no, no this problem. is no kind problem. of the, I, the reason I told it is because this is the first time where I was like, oh, shoot, like I, I can do this, you know? Right, right. Um, you know, they were my manager at Blockbuster. They were selling like monthly memberships um, and um, they were like averaging maybe two or three a day per store. And I can remember being told like, hey, there's a little bonus in here if you sell, you know, a membership. And I, I remember selling like over 20 on a Sunday. Oh, wow. And it was like, I remember my manager coming in the next day and being like, there hasn't been a store in the country that sold 20 in a day. And you just sold over 20 in, in like an eight hour shift. Like that's, how, how that's did incredible. you do that, right? And so I remember feeling that success and feeling that win and being like, oh, Okay, so I, I can I can do something in business. I can do something in sales. So, you know, that was kind of the first taste, I guess. Um, and you know, as I've started ten businesses, yeah, I, nine I of them have failed. Right. You know, so it's like yeah, no, no, no. I think I think it was a, a very good point. And I, I just wanted to kind of stay there for a second, like that that especially when you're young, that validation of like you actually delivering something and people like like acknowledging it, like that, that's everything. I feel like that's like the grounding, right? That's like, that's the spark that makes us feel like, man, we got this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it kind of proved, because I think uh, even as men, we're insecure, right? hundred percent. Right. As boys, you're insecure, you know? And so I think when you do something, like you said, where you get validated and people are like, oh, shoot, you can, you can actually do something. You, you, you can be, you know, you can be successful or you, you can accomplish something. I think it definitely it puts a fire under you, I think, um, you know, at least it did for me. But uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's really interesting you say that because I remember I, I, um, I used to work for Men's Warehouse. It was actually Mr. Tux before yeah, Men's Warehouse I purchased Mr. it. Tux. And I was in high school and um, during uh, prom season, actually before prom season, they used to do this like promotion thing where you find like the cool kids in the school to wear the, you know, the, the tuxedo. So I just got hired that, um, that January. And I was right. I was working right on South Willow, and um, my manager was like, "Yeah, we do this thing every year, and you know, we, we're always looking for people in the schools to rock the." T-. And I was like, "Say no more," because at that point, I had a lot of friends in school. You know, they like to dress sharp, and right. I was like, "All right." So I reached out to like five yeah. of my boys in high school, and they right away they're like, "Dale, sign me up." So um, they came in. They can pick whichever tuxedo that they wanted. Why didn't you call me, bro? 
I, you know what I mean? If, if we would have awesome. known each other, you know, I, I would have drove by the Blockbuster. Yeah. I would have been like, yo, give me a deal and some, some of this rental yeah. and I'll hook you up. So part of the promotion was they had to actually wear the suit at school, like during the school day. So that's how you promoted it. Okay. So that, that's the strategy yeah, that you know, we put in place. Right. So obviously a lot of my friends, they had no shame in their game. So they came in. One of my friends had like a three-piece you know, you know, pinstripes with right. the with the fedora, with the cane, everything, and and that's eye catchy, right? So of you're course. walking down the hallway like during the school day with that, someone's gonna be like, "What's going on?" Right. You say, "Mr. Tuck." So anyway, so I ended up killing it. Like for me, it was just fun. It was just of like a course. fun thing. You yeah. Know? I ended up killing it. I remember my manager came back and was like, "Wow, we've never had this." And then they had this little coupons that they would give out. It's almost like they're passing out money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Making it rain. Yeah. <laughs> they're making it rain with yeah. Mr. Tuck's coupon. Yeah. And um, it was so successful that a lot of the students, they ended up coming through a men's warehouse, uh, Mr. Tuck's at the time, to get fitted through me. But it was one of those things for me because it was like, my, it was kind of like my first corporate retail job. So, yeah. like, I took it serious. I had to dress up, you know, and to see the impact of it and my manager kind of acknowledging that. That's why I was like, man, this, this, it felt good. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, now I would love to hear a little bit of like what you're doing now. I know you've had, you know, the, from 14 years old to where you are now, you, you know, you've, you've had a lot of different experiences yeah. that's kind of shaped who you are and you've taken a lot of different directions. So um, I would love to learn about a little bit of what you're doing now and how mm. you got to what you're doing now. Yeah. So I, I started a company called Apparel Impact in 2014. Um, I was I was with like software and technology companies. You know, I got married early. I was 20 when I got married. Right, we got two kids. So I, I start I I started living the adult life pretty early. So I needed to do something fast. And so I ended up working for corporations like Comcast and Oracle. And I actually worked for Dyne mm -hmm. here in Manchester. And so I was in software and technology, but. In 2014, while I was still working in, in tech, I started a company called Apparel Impact. And it, it's, a, it's a textile recycling company. So we recycle clothing and shoes um, and accessories like purses and backpacks and all that type of stuff. Um, because, you know, 85% of Americans throw their clothes in the trash. That's, that's a basic statistic. It's been like that for at least 10 years. It's pretty bad. It's real bad. Yeah, it's like it's an average of 80. 75 or 85 pounds of clothes per person in America end up in the trash. Wow. So it, it's a crazy amount. And I did the math one day, and I'm like, if every American recycled their clothing, I think we'd create like 450,000 good-paying jobs. It's like almost a half a million good-paying jobs in America if just everyone decided to recycle their clothing or donate it rather than throw it in the trash. So anyways, a friend of mine in, in 2014 brought it up to me and was like, hey, listen, I worked for a company that recycled clothing when I was a kid. It's a cool concept. I know you're an entrepreneur. You're looking for new stuff. So I started to look into it, and I liked the idea. I thought that um, from what I saw in the industry, um, it's almost like automotive shops. You go into an automotive shop, it's dirty. There's no coffee. You know, it's, it's, it's not a pleasant experience. And in my industry, that's very similar to what you'd find. People that don't run their business as well, the branding isn't there. There's a lot of uh, people and companies that are corrupt in my industry. And so when I saw that, before I started, I said, you know, I think I can do it better than what most of these competitors are doing. I think I can brand better. I think that we can impact the community in a big way, which none of them were doing. You know, they say they did it, but none of them actually did it. Um, I said, you know, I think we can pay our guys more if, if if someday I end up getting employees, which now we do. But when I first started, it was just us. Right, right. Um, and so I just looked at an industry and I was like, you know what, I think I think I can do this better than most of what's out there. And, and sorry for interrupting you, but, but what was what was like the spark, but what was like the deciding factor, right? If you can reflect on all those other different things that you've named, you know, your friends telling you about this industry and you start doing some yeah. research on it, like what was the spark? What was the thing that made you feel like, all right, I'm actually gonna go for it? So um, I think the spark was me trying it. So I went door to door in 2014 and with a pamphlet that said, I'm recycling clothes, I'd like to pick up on Sunday. Um, so you wanted to test it out to yeah. see if it was actually viable. Yeah, yeah, you know, is there really enough clothing? Like uh, what I'm reading about, is there that much clothing out there, number one? 
Number two, is it a viable market? Like if I made a phone call and said, listen, I have a bunch of recycled clothing. It didn't end up in the trash. Is there a market for this? You know, is right. that going to be an easy phone call? It, you know, are there buyers for that type of stuff? And so I tried it and, you know, I collected like 350 bags in a week wow. of clothing. Um, of just me going door to door and, and hanging, you know, handing out a, a piece of paper with a trash bag. Um, and so that proved it to me. I was like, okay, so there's, there's not only a market for it, but there's enough clothing out here where, you know, it really is in a, ending up in the trash. Why not start a business that has an impact on the environmental end of things, on the community end of things, you know, economically. So I tried it out and it, it worked. I was like, Okay, so we, you know, I built bins out of wood and shingles and vinyl siding. Wow. You know, and I, I placed four bins out there in Manchester uh, to test it out. And um, I went back the next week and there was, you know, 20 bags of clothes in each bin. That's incredible. So there was definitely a market, meaning yeah. there, there, there was a demand there. People had clothes just sitting around that yeah. were ready to, to, to give it away. Yeah. Yeah, and so th that's when I was like, okay, I think I can make this a legitimate business with an impact to the community, which we've done, you know, for almost five years now. You know, we, we on average clothe anywhere from two to 3,000 people a year in, in New Hampshire and Maine. Uh, we work with school districts where, you know, the school nurse has an apparel impact email dedicated to them where they'll email a clothing request. Say a kid just walked in, they don't have a winter jacket or winter boots, we'll deliver it to the school. That's incredible. Um, you know, and... I guess, you know, we've built something that really hasn't been done before in our industry. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're cleaning up our industry a little bit. We're giving it a better reputation. And as far as the company is concerned, you know, we started with four wooden bins. And, you know, you fast forward today, we have almost 200 locations across New Hampshire, Maine, and Massachusetts, right? And uh, those are all customers, and we have a great reputation from service. You know, we have a great reputation in the community. We have a good brand, and it's like, okay, you know, what started out of in uncertainty, would this is this even a legitimate business or operation? It turned into, you know, we have multiple trucks, employees, and, and a great operation. So, you know, sometimes it just takes testing the waters. Right, right. You know? And, and I, I'm a big believer of that, you know, I, I constantly meet so many different people that have different ideas and, and I'm always like, bro, you got to have your own sandbox. And it sounds like you had your own sandbox. So that whole concept of a sandbox means you have your own space to play around with that idea that you have yeah. in order to even see like what comes out of it. Yeah. Where most people, they want everything to be perfect before they execute. Yeah. So that's, I mean... You know, that's one of the big, I think, with people who want to start things or, or you know, I want to do this or I want to do that. And my, my wife, Sarah, and I were actually just talking about this. You know, I, I don't know. For me, I don't relate with that concept. Mm -hmm. If I come up with an idea or if I want to do something, I just dive in and do it. Um, failure isn't negative. It's right. just a learning experience and you're just going to do it better. But there are a lot of people out there that have always dreamt about doing something, but they wait for quote unquote the right time, you know, or all the pieces line up. And I just, I don't think that's how really it should work because right. it's never going to be the right time. I mean, I had a wife and two kids and I was working and, you know, we got a mortgage and it's never really the right time to jump in and do something that you want to do. You kind of just have to do it to see if it works and then you know, go for, you got to take chances and risks. I mean, without risks, there's no reward. So a hundred percent. I do want to, I do want to kind of get your feedback around, um, when you actually, so you, you started it from scratch and you, you tested it out, it started working and you started to see the momentum that you're building. But what, what was the deciding factor that, that made you feel like, Oh, you know what? I'm actually, I, I'm going to devote like majority of my time on this. Like that transition from, you know, your nine to five to completely <clears throat> taking this and, yeah. and focusing on it. Um, I think that um, it was something that I could wrap my head around. It was a business that wasn't so complicated to where I didn't think that I could run it efficiently and do it well. Um, it was a business that I found to be simple. What I mean by that is because I found it to be manageable and simple enough, I felt confident enough to say, okay, I can do this full time. I don't know if there's a spark. You know, it. it's not really... You know, I do hear a lot of stories of entrepreneurs where it's very sexy and they, you know, they sleep on the couch for a year while they're doing something. You know, for me, um, 
I just kind of take a, uh, I just kind of am a little bit more logical about it and, and just looking at things and fine tuning them and seeing if they work and, and testing them out and taking my time and then jumping in. You know, I, I built up the company to 50 customers and 50 locations while I was still working in technology. That's incredible. So I built up a company that was able to support me, support an employee, support customers, the service, the trucks before I even left my job. Um, now that's a lot of hours, right? You know, right. you work a Saturday. Did, did you Sunday sleep at all, man? Hardly. Yeah. Right. So, but you know, so I just kind of went, um, at it that way. Um, so I don't know if there's really a spark. I think I just was, I think I just was logical about, it and I said, if I do this, this, and this, I know it can be a well-run company and then I can take the chance when I know I've built something that can sustain my income, my family, my business at the same time. And so that's when I decided to leave and just go full time. That's that's amazing, Joey. That's that's really awesome. I just called you Joey again. It's all good. And I didn't say it's when. allowed. <laughs> Only seven. Only seven. All right. So um, obviously, part of growing a business and being an entrepreneur and, and and the grind and the hustle, there's you know there, there's challenges and hurdles that comes a long way. If you can recall some of the stuff that you kind of had to you know overcome, and, and what were the critical thing that the critical thing that contributed to make sure that you can continue on and continue to, to scale this? So the biggest uh, hurdle that I had in the beginning was um, financing. When you're a new business and you haven't proved yourself on your tax returns yet, right? Because you're brand new. Right. Um, but you know the concept works and you're proving it out. You see it on a day-to-day -day basis. You're generating revenue. You have a good reputation. You're growing. When I went to the banks to say, hey, I need more... I need more recycling bins. I need more bins to get out there because I'm growing. I, I'm no longer building these out of wood because the concept it has been proven. So now right. I need to move to like a legitimate bin um, and grow. You know, the banks weren't there for me. Mm. No local, no national. You just started as a business. You're brand new. The bins we don't look at as assets because they're placed all over the place. And if, if we need to come collect, we're not driving around with a truck collecting these bins because they don't have value on the used market is what right. they say. So everything... So there's a lot of liability that's against you regarding yeah. the risk of, hey, we're going to take a bet on this dude's business. It wasn't there. So I, I, was, I was denied multiple times in the beginning. And so, you know, you have to go to... Pro, you got to call, you know, call friends and family. You have to raise money for a business that you're trying to prove out from friends and family. That sounds like a very humbling experience. How, how do you even get to that point, right? Because there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there that might have gotten as far as you got, and then all of a sudden they get that hurdle like, hey, the banks are like, man, not right now. And then, you know, that, that's a very humbling thing that you had to do where you had to kind of like neutralize yourself and say, hey, I'm going to have to reach out to friends and family. It is humbling, yes. Um, I, it was easier for me because at that point, I already had proved the concept in the business and it was growing. So it's not, it's not like I came up with an idea and then I presented it to friends and family saying, I have an idea. I think gotcha. it might work. It was already a business that people could see, oh, I saw your bin. I saw, I saw another bin. So it was like, listen, we're growing. We're generating revenue. You know, it's profitable. Um, but banks, they want two years tax returns. They want you to put your house up for, you right. know, collateral. collateral. And so, um, it was a little bit easier. It is humbling it, primarily because it's, you know, I have, I have a weird relationship with banks. I, I don't like them in general. I'm five years in, I have relationships with banks. We have banks that do fund us. I still don't like them because I feel like they over promise and under deliver. You know, there are signs in their marketing is, We'll fund you. We're we're a champion of we're small community business. focus. We're, we're yeah. It's like community focus. We clothed three thousand people in our community last year. Not last, year, but you know when I was starting this, you know, um, we're generating revenue, and you can't even you know finance twenty thousand for twenty bins or twenty five bins. So I, I have a weird relationship with banks where I still have that chip on my shoulder where mm. I don't want to go to you. You know, that's how I feel. Yeah, um, that's that's a very good point that you bring up. It seems like there's there's definitely a disconnect between how uh, corporate entity like banks how they position their narrative to the masses right like we 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 are inclusive we're you know we're going to work with you we uh you know we have programs and packages that's that's differential than mm -hmm. others 
But then when you get in the weeds, you're just like, bro, I, f- I feel hopeless right now. Like, what? I shouldn't even come here. You know what I mean? Almost kind of, almost kind of embarrassed a little bit. Well, it is embarrassing. I mean, because because you're, you're you're meeting with you're meeting with other people in the community. New Hampshire, for me, it's a small community. Everyone knows each other. Very small. Number one. Number two, you're meeting with someone at a bank that really doesn't make the decision. They have a piece of paper of, of specific guidelines. They got a there. protocol. That's it. Yeah. So, you know, there's no flexibility. It's not like you and I like, hey, I'd like to buy some sneakers off you. All right, can you go like 65 instead of 70? There's none right, of that. Right. There's no bargaining. Nothing. So it's like, hey, sorry, can't do anything. So yeah, it's embarrassing. It it feels like a waste of time, you know. And you know, it, it's funny because as as we've grown as a company, you know, we 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 are bankable. We can get financed for certain things, mm-hmm. um, and it's still a weird discussion. Even five years later, it's like they're asking the same same questions, you know, and. Um, and you know they look at our bins as they're not assets. It's like not assets. It's like you know on the used market, competitors will buy these. You know you you can prove it out, and it's it's still the same discussion. But you're right. I, I do feel the same way where they're marketing to the masses when really they're looking for like one percent of, of people that are that are you know wanting funding. You right. Know? The, so. the criteria of what qualifies is not as inclusive as as it's presented at and, all. But but you've you've overcome all those challenges, yes. and you're on the other side, and now you're you know you you got you got a team of folks, you got yeah. you know you got a whole operational happening. Um, so what's what's the goal as you continue to move forward? The goal is really to to continue to grow. You know, our first year, um, I think maybe we I placed. You know, we we had twenty customers. You know, you move to the second year, we had sixty. So it's you know three hundred percent growth. That's incredible. You know, the third year we had 150% growth. Fourth year we probably grew like 60%. This past year we grew 33%. As the years, as the years grow, the growth is good, right? Any company would be excited to grow 35% in a year. I mean, that's excellent growth. But the number does decrease because the bigger you get, um, you know, geographically it's more difficult to grow, right? And so my focus really is expanding throughout New England more. You know, right now we have close to 200 sites uh, throughout New England. By the end of 2020, my goal is, is to grow about 33%. Oh, wow. Um, so we're looking to, to add about 70 more sites. Um, from a community aspect, you know, we average about 3,000 people a year that are getting clothed. I'd like to push that to four, 4,000. Um, and we have a, a partnership with Easter Seals as well, Easter Seals New England. Um, or New Hampshire, they manage Maine as well, um, and so we're actually working on some pretty cool stuff with them. That's awesome. As far as sites, and and I can't talk about it now, but um, it's pretty exciting, and I think I think it could change the way my industry works, and so that's kind of my goal is to work on on that development and partnership with Easter Seals, as well as growing our sites and customers throughout New England. Um, basic hustling. Placing bins, getting customers, community impact. I mean, that's our that's our goal for the next year. That's super, and you're doing it with the, such a social impact, um, like embedded into your business model, which is amazing. And yeah. um, um, so, my last question for you is, uh, you know, part of part of this podcast is about you know perseverance to excel, right? So it sounds like you you've had to persevere through all the different hurdles that's been presented of you creating this very community, you know, focused and social impact business. And, um, you know, for the listeners that are out there listening, that are uh, in a position where, you know, things might not be looking completely too good for them. And and, and they got to make that decision in terms of, you know, what do they got to do to keep the momentum going? It it doesn't even have to be in a business structure. It can be at anything. Um, What would you like to say to them in order to, to, to encourage them and inspire them? I would say um, I would say you have to start looking at your challenges and failures differently. Um, I would say the biggest lesson that I've learned in life from my early 20s to now, just being a husband and being a dad uh, and being in careers, is that patience is truly a virtue. It's really difficult to learn patience, especially when you're younger. Um, but I can say the biggest mistakes that I've made in business um, 
have to do with not waiting and not being patient. Uh, you can be driven, and that's great. You can go after your competition like a lion. Good, eat them. Do whatever you need to do. But you have to be patient enough to understand that not everything will come at the time that you want it to come. Sometimes it takes long, longer than you want. And I think that if you can develop yourself to be patient enough, um, I think that you'll win more. You know, that's just been my experience. I know, you know, when I was at Comcast, you know, I was doing extremely well, better than some of my peers there in the same department. They're getting paid more than me. So I said, I'm leaving Comcast. I'm going elsewhere. Where if I had stayed and been patient and had, and had really just kind of proven myself out more, I probably would be much farther along in that corporate career than I was than when I moved. Mm. And so... You know, you just, you, just, you just have to sometimes wait for the right thing to happen. Um, and as long as you're driven and you keep pushing along, that's fine. Um, but that, that would be my biggest thing is like, you know what? Keep, keep driving, keep hustling, keep grinding. Um, but it's okay, to, it's okay to be still and just, and just wait sometimes, you know? And, 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 you know, I always got to follow up. So when you're saying that being patient, um, if you can reflect on your experience, what, what grounds you? in that patient process as you're being patient what's grounding you right because you know patience is sometimes it's waiting right you know what what grounds you at that moment in order for you to 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 hang on and hold on the experience of of knowing what it feels like to act too fast when i wasn't patient and lose out Mm. so 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 maybe whoever's listening they got to lose out two or three times because they weren't patient enough to realize that it's okay that's what's going to ground you is that experience um and uh i think it's just the experience of knowing what it's like to to not be patient enough and wait and lose out you know now as i'm older it's kind of like okay i've been there before I've pushed too hard. I wasn't patient enough. I didn't wait on, on it. I wanted it to happen too fast. And I know what that feels like, so I don't want to go back. So, you know, t- take it from me. Don't, you, don't have to learn the, you don't have to learn the hard way, you know? Wow. Thank you so much, Joe, for yeah, brother. joining me in the podcast today. And uh, thank you to all the listeners. Keep um, following and sharing Persevere to Excel podcast. Thank you, brother. Thank you.